Go. This is the new day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord be with you. Also it's good to see y'all here for our second Sunday here at Worship on the Water. Glad you could come down. I appreciate you braving uh, the rain or the possibility of rain. Appreciate you all uh, having the faith that we would be out here at least uh, uh, at the moment without rain falling. It's good to have you. I do realize it's hard to believe we're almost halfway through 2021. That's uh, hard to believe, but the end of June happens next week. And then in two weeks from today is July 4th. And so we will be having our celebration of freedom service here, nine o'clock uh, on July 4th, the actual day. And so I hope that you will come. If you have family with you, friends uh, visiting, I hope you'll bring them with you. Uh, that day it will be a day uh, that we'll be celebrating the freedom that we have and remembering July 4th. And so I just hope that you'll be a part of that as well. Today we continue in ordinary time in the text. The gospel text for today is a fairly famous text uh, from the gospel of Mark where Jesus uh, calms the storm. And so it's always uh, pretty much a favorite of people in the church of folks being all upset about how the storm is going and then Jesus, Jesus is vast asleep and then gets up and, and calms the storm. So uh, that's our text uh, for today, Mark the fourth chapter. But it's good to have each of y'all here for church today. I forgot to mention that on July 4th, we're gonna, in, we're gonna bring back congregational singing uh, because of the significance of the songs we sing that day and whatever. We're gonna see how it goes. And so if you aren't comfortable with that, uh, I would encourage you to get here early and sit in the back or in the corner or whatever, uh, kind of away from it, make sure you're in a cross phrase and it shouldn't be a problem. But uh, we're gonna see how it goes. We're, we're hearing, there's still not been any published uh, studies as far as singing is concerned as the significance of it, uh, but we're kind of watching churches do it. And so it doesn't seem to be spreading stuff. So uh, two weeks from today, we will have congregational singing, just so you realize. Looking to have communion the 1st of August. And so looking to kind of bring that back there. So be patient with us. We're trying to be wise, trying to be smart trying to be cautious and conservative in how we come out of the pandemic. So please uh, keep all that in mind. 
Our text today, as I said earlier, comes from Mark, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 35 and going through verse 41. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Later that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd, took him in the boat, just as he was. Other boats followed along. Gale force winds arose and waves crashed against the boat so that the boat was swamped. But Jesus was in the rear of the boat, sleeping on a pillow. They woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? Jesus got up and gave orders to the wind, and he said to the lake, Silence, be still. The wind settled down, and there was a great calm. Jesus asked them, Why were you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Overcome with awe, they said to each other, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. As we enter our time of prayer meditation, we'll take a moment of silence. You'll be able to hear birds around you, water lapping up on the shore, other sounds of nature that are around you as we're reminded once again of how we're connected uh, to God's created order. We're part of that creation. Uh, but then also as you're hearing these wonderful sounds of nature, be listening for the still small voice of God speaking directly to you as you lay the concerns of your hearts before God and the concerns that maybe you're not even sharing with other people. Just lay them before God and then be hearing uh, the word that God has for you individually. After we have that private moment of conversation, I'll lead us in the community prayer and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let us bow. <clears throat> We've gathered once again, O oh God, in this place to come and to worship you. And Lord, we're just thankful as we sit here beside the shores of Lake Lacone, the serenity that surrounds us, the storm that has passed over, and we've come back on the day after. We're reminded on Sundays like this, O oh God, of how protected we are and how even post-storms, that, that there is time post the storm, and we're able to uh, live life realizing that storms are temporary, that you will see us through them, and that we can come out on the other side. Lord, today there's some that don't have this kind of setting, aren't living this kind of life, and we pray for those, Lord, who live in much more dangerous situations, uh, whether they're still dealing with the pandemic in very severe terms, whether they're dealing with violence uh, that is around them, whether there's hunger, food deserts, and other dynamics that may be impacting their lives. Lord, we lift them up, praying uh, for, for your sustaining presence with them and praying for your guidance in ways that we can help uh, individuals who are in such circumstances. So God us in how we need to live, how we need decisions we need to make uh, in the days ahead, Lord, uh, for those who are less fortunate uh, than the blessings that we have here. Today, O oh Lord, as we uh, look at the story of Jesus in the boat, uh, with the disciples who are terrified because of the storm that they are called in and the serenity, the calmness that Jesus has in the midst of it. Help us to really resonate with that and help us to be like Christ, 
to be like Jesus and to really live with calm even when life circumstances are tossing and turning the boats that we live in. Uh, forgive us, Lord, when we don't. Uh, forgive us, Lord, when we too panic and become anxious and nervous and, and aren't willing to see the bigger picture in ways that Jesus saw the bigger picture. Uh, so forgive us, Lord, and, and do help us to turn. Turn in how we live, uh, to, to, to move in new directions, and to become the people of God that you've called us to be. Uh, bless our service today. Uh, bless our time with each other. Uh, and help us, Lord, uh, uh, to truly uh, find new convictions in our lives to live the life that you've called us to live. Uh, we pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. From the 44th Psalm, we hear this. God, wake up. Are you going to sleep all day? Do you not care what happens to us? Psalm 44, 23, that's how the message translates that text. Talking to God like that seems a bit rude. And it seems somewhat pretentious that we would actually say that to God. But these words are from the Bible where the writer of the 44th Psalm was feeling kind of confused. Life was, was anxious and they were feeling anxious about it. And they were a bit annoyed with God. It seemed to the psalmist that God had gone to sleep on the job and, and was no longer responsive to the needs of his people. God, wake up. Are you going to sleep all day? Do you not care what happens to us? We heard something similar from the disciples in the gospel reading that I just did from the fourth chapter of Mark. Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that we are about to drown. They were feeling that Jesus didn't really care what happened to them as they battled a fierce storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. There are times when you and I feel that the circumstances of life are swamping us. In the middle of the storm, all that you and I can feel is that violent rocking of the boat, hearing the howling wind, Seeing the winds, the, the waves wash over us. And it seems, it seems that you and I are all alone. Because no one, no one knows precisely the terror and the confusion that is in our hearts. We make things even worse. What makes things even worse is that God seems to be a million miles away. Think about it, sitting with parents whose child was taken through an accident or an illness. A young mother whose husband took his own life. A child whose grief is inconsolable after the loss of a parent. A young man who's responsible for his brother's death in a car accident. A person who despairs because an illness or an accident has changed life forever. Feeling the pain of these is very easy to be overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by the storm in these people's lives and to join the songwriter that says, God, wake up. Don't you care? The idea of a sleeping God is not something new. In the last part of the 19th century, philosophers spoke about the death of God and it's been revived at various times ever since. We have in our Gospel for Mark a story about the sleeping God, told with Mark's eyes for detail. This is Mark's picture. Jesus has been teaching beside the Sea of Galilee. The, the crowds have been so eager that the teacher has moved into a small fishing boat. And while the people sat on the edge of the water, from his boat, the teacher instructed the crowd about the, the kingdom of God uh, using stories from everyday life. 
And at the end of the day, Jesus tells his disciples to take him across the lake. The disciples weigh anchor and, and head across the lake when suddenly a violent wind attacks the boat. And I use the word attack deliberately. It's like a storm. The storm was like a wild animal shaking and ripping its prey. You see, Mark in this text talks about this storm and he uses a word that has demonic connotations in the Old Testament. So he view, views it as the devil literally coming up in the midst of the storm. This is no ordinary storm. It's a storm that will test faith and trust in God. The wind is howling. The waves are mountainous. The little boat is tossed about. The men on board cry out, we're taking on water. We're going to die. It's time to panic. In the very center of the cyclone, there is this eye where everything is calm and still. And, and the eye of the storm was actually in the stern of this little boat as it rocked and heaved back and forth. In one sentence, Mark creates an image. He creates an image for our minds of the peacefulness of Jesus. There in the middle of the storm, out there in the middle of the waves and the wind and the panic of the men in the boat, there in the stern of the boat lay Jesus, sleeping peacefully on a cushion. Mark describes this whole scene with so few words, and yet is able to give such a vivid picture of the veracity of the storm and the panic of the disciples on one hand, and the serenity and peacefulness of Jesus on the other. And then comes the desperate appeal to the sleeping God. Jesus, don't you care? Now what's going on here? The rabbi carpenter is a picture of calm in the midst of chaos. The gospel writer Mark loves to paint portraits of chaos with Jesus in the middle of it, and with Jesus in complete control of it. Jesus and his friends, in fact, are journeying, journey, journey, excuse me, goodness, journeying toward another chaotic situation. For in, when they actually arrive at Garcia, when they go actually to the other side of the lake, and they arrive at Garcia, there, they will meet a madman so filled with demons that his entire village is all worked up. And once again, Jesus will master the situation. He'll create peace, and the crowd will be filled with fear. You see, the first church, Christianity in the first century, the first church that heard this gospel from Mark was probably sitting in Rome. It too, that church was facing a chaotic situation. For you see, the Emperor Nero was feeding good Christians to the lions. The Christians were blamed and they were persecuted for the fire that destroyed a large part of Rome. When the Roman Christians read this story of the demonic storm, the chaos on the lake, the sleeping God. They saw it as a description of their own situation. Satan was using the storm of persecution to weaken their faith and in the chaos to doubt whether God really cared about them. They were powerless to fight Nero and to fight the persecution. And no doubt they called out exactly as the disciples did in the boat, Lord, don't you care that we're about to die? You and I, we have our own brand of chaos. You and I, we have our own storms that we have to deal with. We know what it's like to have storms break into our homes or at work or in our neighborhoods or among friends or in the church or in the community as a whole. 
By storms, I mean anything. Anything that upsets the smooth sailing of our lives. Oh, it could be a misunderstanding, an act of impatience, grief, the loss of something that you valued, anything. Anything that destroys the calmness and the peace in our lives. Our first inner instinct, our first instinct in any chaotic situation is to try to sort through the situation itself. The disciples realized that even though they had done their best to keep the ship afloat during the storm, th th this storm had actually held it in its grip. There was nothing that these disciples could do. They were about to sink. But as the crew ran from stem to stern, from port to starboard, giving commands, giving vent to their anger as the waves crashed over the side, at each moment it is packed with straining and decisions and physical activity. And in the midst of all of that, they overlook one important thing. They overlook the fact that Jesus was there in the boat with them. God isn't responsible for the chaos in our lives, but God is there to help us overcome the chaos that the world around us and that the evil one wrecks in our lives. God tells us again and again and again, as if we need constant reminding that he is in the boat riding the storms with us and that if we let him, if we will let God, God uses those storms to strengthen us and to bless us. God reminds us, don't ever be afraid or discouraged. I am the Lord your God and I will be there to help you wherever you go. George Falk was a sailor in the First World War. And once he wrote home, he wrote this, I quote, if you should hear that I have fallen in battle, do not cry. Remember that even the ocean in which my body sinks is only a pool in the Savior's hand. George knew that Christians experience death or sorrow just like anyone else. Faith does not in any way make you and I immune from pain and anguish. George Fox knew that it was frightening. It was a frightening thing to go down in a ship and to be strangled by cold, dark water. But he knew something more. He believed that the threatening, choking elements were only a pool in the hand of the Savior. Therefore, no matter how, where he fell, no matter where he sank, the hand of the Lord surrounded him and, in fact, saved him. And as long as he kept his eye on the owner of that hand, it was immaterial. It was immaterial if he went over the waves or were swallowed by them. The gospel story is relevant to all of us. As in all kinds of ministry where you and I are dealing with people, there will be times of sunny skies that will fill you with exhilaration and joy and confidence. And then there'll be those dark, stormy days when you'll be tossed around and you'll wonder what it was that made you step into this boat in the first place. There'll be internal struggles stirred by the evil one and the flaws in our human nature as you and I struggle with fear, doubt, and more questions than there are answers. And at times, it's those internal storms that can be most severe. We join Christians of all times and all places in these kinds of storms. Take it from somebody who knows. It's easy to become so focused on the storm that you forget who is in the boat with you. Not only are all of your fellow disciples here at LOCC and beyond who are keen to support and to encourage help, but also the master himself. When the disciples believed that there was no hope, that they would soon sink into the watery deep, Jesus stood up, not an easy thing to do on a rocky, heaving boat. Jesus stood up, 
But in so doing, he demonstrated his clear presence among them and his mastery of the situation. He called out to the wind and the waves, and everything went still. The disciples stood there with their mouths hanging wide open. How could they have been so short on faith? How could they have not seen the love that would never let anything overcome them? How could they so easily be overcome by the situation that they lost sight of the one who loved them so powerfully? Who knows what is in store for any of us in the future? But one thing is for sure. Jesus is right here in the boat with us. God's eternal answer to the chaos that you and I are experiencing is here I am right here with you in the middle of your home, your church, your job, guiding you in whatever decisions you must make, supporting you when you have reached your limits. And with Christ in our boat, sharing in our storms, he even says to us, quiet, be still. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Please stand as we go through the storms of life, as we live life, as we leave this place. We go out with the challenge that St. Francis gave us 800 years ago to be instruments of God's peace in this world as we seek to truly make a difference. Let us leave this place with that determination. Do hope that you'll be back in two weeks. Uh, be back next week, I hope, for church uh, if you're in. But especially if you're here on July 4th, bring friends with you, neighbors, others. Hope you'll come and join us on that special day as well. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. 
Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. We hope that you will join us again uh, in uh, any Sunday you can here online. But if you're in the Lake area, I hope you'll come out and be with us in person at 9 o'clock every Sunday morning here at the Pavilion. Hope you'll join us. Thanks for being here.